I can remember being in college when um, Bush and Gore, there was that whole um, counting issue in Florida. I didn't even think anything of it. I, I didn't think like, wow, this is, this is potentially dangerous or this is uh, going to cause a crisis. Never once did I think of that because I just trusted implicitly, trusted that the political system of America was stable and that yeah, there might be some corruption and, you know, James Baker might pull a few strings for Bush or whatever. But I implicitly trusted that the political system would function and that we'd find out who would win and then there would be a concession and then an inauguration. I don't even know what I mean. I have no idea. What's, I mean, anything could happen. There's, there's zero trust. I mean, there's zero trust. I mean, I certainly don't trust that. I don't trust... I, I really don't trust either party or either player, but, but, but for very different reasons. You know what I mean? So I think that the way the Democrats operate and the Republicans operate are very different. And I think there, there might be some good things and bad things on both sides. But I think in either case, they are so locked into a political rivalry that both are going to engage in things that the other are going to find questionable. And you're going to just see some kind of decomposition that, that first week in November. Absolutely, <clears throat> you know, which is, you know, how I stumbled on to the ideas. I'm watching uh, both parties, both the right and the left, and now with the, the conflicts and with the violence and the demonstrations of takeovers, whatever, I started to stop looking at the, the circumstances, you know, and the events and start to say, well, wait a minute, let's analyze this. What is the mindset of the individuals involved? Um, for example, you know, I uh, had a situation where I was dealing with some stuff and uh, I, I came up with this analogy that uh, the kids are acting up, the children are acting up. And I started to imagine um, what, looking at, and this might be very simplistic and, uh, you know, my own, but, you know, going around destroying, what, what is the mindset of people who want to just tear down statues, or burn things, loot? Uh, what is that mindset that puts one in that frame of mind? And what is the, so as all of that is happening, there's also another part of society that makes sure that all of the grocery shelves are stocked, that all the utilities are running, that all the health care is being taken care of. There's that mindset. And so, um, I, I you know, what is going to be... One of the things that's been amazing is to see the, impor the absolute importance of um, truck drivers, nurses, um, counter workers at supermarkets, um, their absolute <clears throat> essentiality to the basic functioning of day-to-day -day American rhythm. I don't think before this people Absolutely. realized just how important these people were. Because there is this whole element, what I think I'm going to forget about in the 21st century, mm -hmm. just the, at, and the sheer velocity of human existence, the effects of microelectronic technologies and computational power kind of constantly pulsing at our brain, which, which always has a disorientation effect and just makes us not really pay attention to things. We always forget that there's this like, whole swath of society that's still in a way... 1920s or the 1950s. You know what I mean? They just show up to work and, and do their thing. Um, and that's so important because one of the problems yep. of 21st century society, mm -hmm. and, 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 and this speaks also to why there's so much desperation amongst certain people in America, is that computers and algorithmic power and networks have taken on so much human agency that so many of us just feel impotent and hopeless and uh, unable to express our own agency. Um, something, I mean, you know, the situation of riots in America is a complicated question. There's a lot of things in play. It's not, a, it's not simply just frustrated young people. There's, there's un, un, unhealed um, social wounds. There's poverty. There's frustration. There's the meta structure of the global economy. There's the effect of social media on people's sense of reality and their own psychic um, organization. So there's all kinds of problems. Uh, when you get into a situation like this, 
when people start demanding that, and I think it's most interesting about the whole protest with the demand that statues come down. When you start doing that, you know you're kind of coming to the end of it. You know that the, the instability is paramount and the potential of um, the state or the potential for things to get out of control is, 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 is looming. It's there. Because when you start doing statues, you're essentially dismantling the, the historical and public uh, symbolism of a country or a city or wherever the statue is uh, being taken down. And once you start doing that, you're not just taking down statues. You're dismantling the historical symbolic structure of a, of a society. And I mean, but at the same time, see, I, I had mixed feelings about it, you know? I mean, I thought that in terms of the Confederate soldiers, I mean, my feeling was that as an American history major, I think there's, there's a need to understand the Civil War and there's, an under, there's a need to understand um, um, the Southern Army. If you want to understand the Civil War, you have to understand the biography of Robert E. Lee. You have to know character of Stonewall Jackson. I mean, this is part of the story. I don't blame people for, you know, African Americans for wanting to take down Confederate statues and you know, South Carolina, Virginia. I mean, I don't blame them at all. Um, so I just think that, and, and this kind of comes to the crisis, is that the situation right now in America between the left and the right, it's, it, it's the, the, the declining situation is both irreconcilable and irreversible. There's no way to, like, agree upon and let's leave the statue up so we can learn about the Civil War and let's tear it down. I mean, these, you, you, you can't integrate these anymore. These are, these are drifting further and further apart. And that, you know, talking about Civil War statues, is just a microcosm of a whole host of other issues that are inscribed into the, the uh, now decomposing, um, I guess I use the term symbolic edifice of, of Americana. So, yes, it's, it's a very, very, very dangerous time right now, for sure. There's no doubt about it. And I think we all feel that. Well, if this is... What, what I've been trying to get to for a little bit was your post today is exactly, this is what you're addressing, that um, it is so far apart, it's so diverse, that there's no getting back. It, you know, as, as we all, as you and I understand, uh, the political spectrum doesn't right, run left to right in a linear line. It goes in a circular line, so that the raging fundamentalist who is righteous is not much different than the politically correct uh, righteousness uh, of uh, of the left, so that the left and the right don't end up on completely different uh, distant shores. They end up totally. They become the same being. But that's like the same as you know. If if you get into a fist fight in the schoolyard, the two people are going to start looking a lot alike after about five minutes. They're going to be throwing punches at each other. You know what I mean? So I, I think any time, right. any time you get into an argument with somebody, you tend to become more like them rather than differentiate yep. them. And, and, and even though sure. the left and the right in America are speaking about different content, they're locked into a formal process in which they begin to act like each other and mirror each other and adopt similar tactics. What's interesting is like they spend so much time trying to differentiate themselves that they end up re- showing us that they're actually a lot alike. You know, so I think... Exactly, exactly. Exactly. Um, there is something very true that elements on the left and elements on the right mirror each other in a very real way, in a very formal way, um, even though they're uh, expressing their concerns and their disagreement through different mechanisms. And, you know, again, I, I think it keeps coming to the surface in my mind is, so h- how do we navigate through this? How do we survive this uh, on an individual in, in I think you know, addressing the the grocery workers, the truckers, all of the people who somehow wake up with a totally different mindset than somebody who has the time and energy to go down and take down a statue or loot or protest or whatever. They they just want to uh, you know obviously have uh, survive on themselves, but they're 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 thinking outside of themselves. Uh, 
in, in, in that they have a duty and obligation to you know, keep the whole system going. That's a good point. I mean, I, I do think that what's lacking, and certainly in America, is for lack of a better term, like steady jobs and a normal life. I, I think that is totally lacking. I also think that it's also not possible to do that anymore. I feel like the structure of the economy is a simple way of life. It's gluing people to their smartphones. It's gluing people into social media. It's gluing people into a certain way of existence that forecloses the possibility of just a a steady, eddy type of job. Most especially is that the ideological influence, and this extends into the imagery of social media and Madison Avenue and Hollywood, presented people like that for so long in such unflattering terms that no, no one wants to do that because all the imagery that we consume as 21st century global citizens, it's always like this kind of avant-garde, yuppie existence. So just being an, an average Joe working, working as a church or whatever <laughs> isn't appealing anymore. So, so people like that tend to be denigrated and feel denigrated when, when if anything, people like that are like the, the heroes, I guess, for lack of a better term, of American society. Because when we discovered it, what, what we really discovered during the pandemic is that there were more people like that, we'd all be in a lot of trouble. We'd all be in a lot of trouble. Exactly. So, exactly. And, right. And what is going on in the mind of those individuals versus on the, the mind of somebody occupying a certain section of the city or waking up every single day looking for conflict, destruction, uh, anger, venting, da, 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 entitlement. You know, you're, so, you, so you take over six uh, blocks of a, of a city. Do you ever stop and think, how are you going to eat? <laughs> Really? Yeah, that, that, I mean, there's the short sightedness of all of this. Yeah, I, I get that too a lot when I, when I talk to people in different spiritual communities and they talk about the transformation of consciousness and a, and a new way of living on planet Earth. <laughs> who's going to deliver the mail? You know what I mean? Who's going who's right. to um, right. mow the lawn type of thing? You know, it's like, like if you enter into this new spiritual dimension or in the case of protests, is this new political dimension, who's going to make sure that the lights get turned on and the water gets turned on? You know, and you this know, is something that I think gets lost a lot in, in emancipatory and radical politics, this kind of practical dimension of the human subject. I mean, most people, I mean, there's something to uh, revolting against repression. I mean, that's natural and that's good. Um, revolutionary or emancipatory political gestures don't tend to be practical. They, they tend to be um, destructive, you know, tearing down the system. And the, the new system, there's a lack of humanness to it. There's lack of practicality to it. So that, to me, is what would, like, what would be interesting to me is, like, a practical revolutionary gesture, you know, something like that. That would be more interesting to me. Right. This is what Russia did. I mean, this is typical. They, you know, they hated the Tsarist system, and they come in and they rip it down and tear it up, and everybody jumps and says, hoo-ha, you've killed all the rich, blah, blah, blah. And then what do they do? They become, you know, tyrannical themselves. You know, they, they, they're controlling, they set up a, you know, a, you know, they put people like Stalin in power, who's a despot. And, they're not, and nobody's thinking of that. And, you know, and then, no matter what, those systems always fail. You know, going back to uh, the Mayflower, you know, they made this pact that everything would be communal. And then they had these gardens, and then people started to figure out, hey, wait a minute, you know, I'm putting in more effort than the next guy. So they said, listen, we want our own gardens. And they said, well, you can't have your own. They said, well, wait a minute, we'll have, how about we do both? And they said, oh, okay, do both. Guess what? I'll produce the communal, the private. I mean, that's the way it works. And, you know, there's this, this, you know, I just saw a post yesterday, the Gallup poll say that in Russia, the young people are uh, looking back at the Soviet Union as a system they would like to go back to. And in America, the young people are looking at socialism as the answer. And boy, oh boy, <laughs> watch out. Yeah, I mean, well, again, mixed feelings on that. You know, I mean, I, I think that um, certainly the, 21st 
20th century 20th century socialism was 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 a failure i guess you could say 